everybody. Um, I think we should get the show on the road. I want to uh, welcome you and uh, give you some information and, uh, and admonish you to please, if you have uh, smartphones, turn off your ringer. And even if you are going to be using Twitter or uh, Facebook Live during the event, which is OK. It's a public event. Um, our Twitter handle is uh, Fake News Panel. Uh, that's capital F, capital N, capital P, Fake News Panel. And uh, this event is being recorded um, by C-SPAN and by others. Uh, and it is also being live cast. And there'll be a video of it. And um, there will also be a podcast uh, f uh, that will be part of the brand new Graduate School of Journalism podcast series, which is called On Mic. And that's M-I-C, Mic. Um, and that is available on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. So I'd like to uh, start by saying that this, is, this event is a, was a collaboration between the Office of Public Affairs, the library, and the Graduate School of Journalism. I'm Deirdre English from the Graduate School of Journalism, and I worked with uh, Kathleen McClay and Cody Hennessy um, to, um, to invite our panelists and, um, and invite all of you. Uh, and I, we really want to thank Marlena uh, uh, Telvik for helping to invite the press here, a lot of members of the media are here, and Julie Hirano, who just does everything with the uh, publicity and the logistics and all the hard work of making, uh, m getting us to all come together as we have. Let me welcome the panelists now. We have a really distinguished panel. Um, so we have uh, right here to my left, the first panelist here is Laura Seidel. And she is the well-known voice on National Public Radio's digital culture correspondent. And I hope many of you heard or will, uh, you know, will listen to her amazing story on disinfo media, one of the stories that really brought this issue to alive in my mind. She uh, tracked down a company with many fake news sites. And that aired for the first time last November and has been listened to many times since. Um, Adam Mazzari. Um, we're very happy to have somebody here who is uh, very high up as the vice president of Newsfeed at Facebook. And he, uh, you know, uh, 1.8 billion people are using Facebook now. And uh, Adam manages the team responsible for delivering relevant content, that's news content, to all those Facebook users. And uh, recently, uh, Facebook has taken some uh, important steps to address the problem of fake news on their platform. Um, and we're delighted to have his presence. Um, we uh, have Craig Newmark with us. Craig is a web pioneer, the founder of Craigslist. He is a speaker and a philanthropist who often introduces himself as, uh, as uh, uh, modestly as a news consumer um, and is, uh, can also claim to be one of the internet's best known nerds. Um, <laughs> But uh, all of this comes right out from his, from his own self-description. But uh, he recently uh, generously donated a million dollars to the Pointer Institute uh, in order to promote verification, fact-checking, and accountability in journalism. So as much as anyone I know, Craig has taken steps to address the problem. Um, and we're joined by two members of the, Ber of the uh, UC Berkeley faculty as well, Catherine Crump is a uh, law school professor, and she's the co-director of Berkeley Law's Samuelson Law, Technology, and Public Policy Clinic. And she specializes in First and Fourth Amendment uh, and media issues and all about censorship and what you can and cannot do. Um, and uh, Jeffrey McKee Mason is UC Berkeley's university librarian, and he is a professor at the School of Information. His scholarly work focuses on the economics of the internet, online behavior, and digital information creation and distribution. Um, finally, uh, our moderator is Dean Ed Wasserman. He's the uh, professor and he's the dean of the Graduate School of Journalism. And uh, his specialty is media ethics. Um, he blogs, perhaps very appropriately titled uh, blog called Unsocial Media. <laughs> and you can find that at ewasserman.com. And I want to thank you, the audience, for your interest in this hot topic. With that, Ed Wasserman. Thank you, Deirdre. Uh, and thank you all for coming out tonight in this uh, chilly evening. 
I want to also welcome a number of tech reporters in the audience from Reuters, New York Times, Mother Jones Magazine, The Guardian, KQED, and The Daily Californian. Um, we have a strong interdisciplinary panel here tonight, uh, and thank you all for, for participating. Uh, now, our, the format will be, we have roughly an hour and a half to play with, and I figured we'd, we'd divide it uh, approximately in half. We'd spend 45 minutes uh, with the discussion confined to the panel. Um, I'm looking for, I'm hoping for a lively discussion, not necessarily an orderly one. Uh, and then, uh, so you're welcome to talk to each other, interrupt each other, put your, uh, and, and, and to move the conversation along. I'll be, po I'll be uh, uh, tossing out questions and goading you uh, when I'm not happy with your answers. Um, and then after 45 minutes or so, we'll open the floor to questions. Opening the floor, as Neil Conan observed at a talk here not long ago, always a troubling concept in seismically active California. <laughs> um, let, let me just kick this off with an opening thought, because I was thinking back to when I started getting interested in the media, and this was late 60s, early 70s, and, and in the shadow of McLuhan and in a great deal of uh, very excited and very, very much utopianist talk about uh, the world of uh, democratized discourse that the media would enable. And, and if you had told me then that 40, 50 years hence, uh, I'd have this device that would give me access to bigger audiences than the widest circulating newspaper on earth had, and would give me access to more information than the best sourced reporter on earth had, I would say, well, that sounds like paradise. It sounds like that would be, that would be what a democratized uh, a, a communication sphere looks like when people are communicatively enabled, uh, and we would have then, you know, acceded to paradise. And and then instead, here we are, and we're finding that there is a dark underside to that, and we're finding when we look around that people are in fact laboring, believe things. More people believe things that are not true than perhaps ever before, uh, and more people are acting on beliefs that they either dimly under, beliefs they either don't misunderstand or uh, understand or are untrue than ever before. And we find that this, uh, this wondrous world of technologically enabled communications paradise has now uh, turned around as biting itself in the backside. So um, let, let me start by uh, asking, and, and, and I guess I would end with, a, we're finding more people than ever enthralled by the uh, shadows on the cave. So uh, what do we do? Um, let me start with this question. I'm gonna invite Laura Seidel to weigh in on it to get us started. Fake news now has become a big, messy topic. There's not even really agreement as to what it is. In fact, it's being brandished as an all-purpose slogan to describe everything from errors to deliberate <coughs> falsehoods. Um, it doesn't, no longer is agreed upon as identifying a unitary phenomenon. So what, what are we talking about and what, can we, what conclusions could we draw about the way the term is now being fought over and the elastic way it's being applied? So Laura, why don't you start us off? Well, I, I guess I want to say there's a, a difference of intent and, and there, there is a big difference. People who are in the fake news business they know what they're doing, they know it's fake, as opposed to when a journalist who's trying to get it right makes a mistake. Um, so I would argue, for example, some people have said, well, Judith Miller's reporting on the weapons of mass destruction was fake news. It wasn't fake news, she made a horrible, I mean, horrible mistake. But the guy that Deirdre mentioned, that I found, that's, this is real fake news and it's very profitable. I mean, we decided we would take one story this was in a, a meeting and I got the assignment to take one story and trace it all the way back. One fake news story that got a lot of attention. And in this case, it was the story of an FBI agent dead in apparent murder-suicide and supposedly this FBI agent had been investigating uh, you know, Hillary Clinton's emails. And so the implication was that somehow this was part of, if you know something about the alt-right conspiracy theories about the Clintons, they murder people off. And um, this appeared on a site called the Denver Guardian, which sounded like a legitimate site. It was not. Um, 
so trying to find where this came from was the idea. Who was this? Who was it that was behind this? It was initially not that easy because usually you can go to GoDaddy and you can discover that there's a website and that website is somebody owns the domain name. In this case, it was anonymous. I enlisted a very smart techie to help me basically look at the internet you know, a bit like a paleontologist, just looking for fossils. And he was able to eventually get me a name. We got an address. And I decided the best thing to do was just to go knock on his door. Um, it turned out he was in Huntington Beach, California. And I had no idea what we were going to find. Um, and uh, I took um, a uh, male intern with me because I was a little nervous about this. But we went to his door, and I held the story in my hand. And, and there he was. His name is Justin Kohler. Knocked on the door, and I said, did you write this? Uh, from NPR, we want to know if you wrote this. And he said, no. I said, do you own the Denver Garden? No. And he closed the door in our faces. And we left him an email. Turns out he's an NPR fan. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. He gets back to us and says, all right, I'll talk to you. Yes, I know about it. And yes, I do on the Denver Guardian website. And what was, he absolutely knew he was doing fake news. In his case, he was a Hillary Clinton supporter too. He said he started this whole thing as kind of a joke. He wanted to show how crazy the alt-right was and how easy it was to spread fake news in the alt-right echo chamber. However, as I did point out to him, um, it was lucrative. In fact, he told me he was making between ten and thirty thousand uh, dollars a month. And he had a whole little empire. It wasn't just this. He had a whole bunch of other websites, too, where he was putting this stuff out there. But it was absolutely intentional. Everything he said, yes, everything about that Denver Guardian story was totally false, and we knew it was totally false. That is fake news. And I, I really do think there is a big difference between a reporter making a mistake and what this gentleman was doing. Um, I guess lastly, you know, on this topic, I would say, I feel like one of the things, though, that's become, that's going on is there's a sense of wanting to make everybody confused. And I think that works in some people's advantage, to have the world be confusing. And um, I have heard people talk about Steve Bannon's interest in um, certain far-right groups in Europe and Russia who actually do use this tactic. <coughs> it is a political tactic. And so, I'm not saying he is, but I think it's something to think about. What is fake news? What is it about? What is its intent? And uh, I think it comes down to that. I, I want to come back to how you make money with fake news. But first, uh, you have identified a pure case of deliberate fabrication, yes. which everybody can agree is fake. Right. But the term is being applied far more broadly to, to capture a sort of underlying simmering dissatisfaction with the quality of information and the trustworthiness of information that people are getting. And I'm wondering how this is now in a political, it, it's playing into the political arena in somewhat unforeseen ways. And I wonder what sense we make of that. Jeffrey, you have thoughts? Well, <clears throat> I don't disagree with what Deborah said, but I do think that for a lot of purposes, when we're talking about information distribution and people wanting to get information out there as providers of it and people wanting to take information in as consumers, it's often useful just to think about quality as being the dimension. And there's high quality news, there's low quality news or information. It's a spectrum, of course. For some purposes, I sometimes think of there being negative quality news. There are certain cases where people are intentionally manipulating, intentionally, as you say. Mm -hmm. But even there, there's, there's a little bit more uh, nuance to it. I think the case you just described, he said A, it was a lark, and B, he was making money on it. It doesn't sound like he was trying to actually persuade anybody to change their behavior. He wasn't trying to manipulate people. But sometimes people are trying to manipulate in trying to use lies, essentially fraud, to manipulate. So there's a malevolent intent that can matter. But I think at first we think of it as, uh, especially if you're a platform provider, for instance, as a content prov platform provider, you care about the quality of the news or the information that's being distributed through your platform. And you want more good quality because you want more people to come to your platform and you want less bad quality. That spectrum is very hard to draw any lines on. Uh, the, and, and sometimes platform providers want different things than their consumers. We might say the platform provider is in it for the money. They just want eyeballs. And as long as they can attract eyeballs, they're selling those eyeballs to advertisers. 
Uh, so they may care about a different aspect of quality. On the other hand, they also want repeat eyeballs. They want to care about reputation. And if they keep delivering bad information, they're not going to get repeat eyeballs. So I, to think about how to design systems and how to understand behavior in this, in this business, I think first I like to think about it just as a spectrum of quality with certain special cases where the problem is not just that it's low quality, but it may actually be malicious or negative quality. But you're not suggesting it's quality that's driving the traffic. Uh, well, to some extent. I mean, people want information for different reasons. I mean, they, some people want information just for entertainment, in which case they may want things that are actually fake. They find it more amusing and entertaining. So it's not a single dimension. But uh, there is, a, I think, in repeated use, there is a correlation, certainly, between quality and what's driving the traffic, that people are going to recognize that certain sources are more reliable than others. And the content provider, uh, if it wants to develop a significant business and keep that going, is going to care about that quality. Yeah. Can I just interject one thing, if, if, if I may, which is that part of the problem is Facebook, because it is an environment <laughs> in which you are looking at all kinds of things that your friends share. And so it's not the same as going to the New York Times website versus going to Breitbart. You're in an environment that feels comfortable and safe. And I didn't mean that like just okay. as a total criticism as Facebook, <laughs> but, but that's part of the issue is that you're not now going to all these separate credible publications. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to uh, stand up for the platforms, and I'm uh, not one of them in any sense. I'm just acting as a news consumer, and I just would like news I can trust. These are really tough problems. One part of it is trolling and harassment. I've been trying to deal with that on a professional basis for over 20 years. All the platforms are taking steps to address this. It's just really tough. For example, Facebook is working with the International Fact-Checking Network and are trying to work with people who are signatories to that agreement, like PolitiFact and uh, Snopes. Google is working with the Trust Project, which is about means by which news organizations can say, hey, here's what's trustworthy behavior. And oversimplify that, it's about having a code of ethics and being serious about it. I've spoken with Twitter directly about the problem of dealing with trolling and harassment. These are really tough problems. The uh, platforms are standing up for them. Hopefully in the really near future, I'll be able to announce with Wikipedia new steps and serious funding about dealing with harassment and trolling. So the platforms are standing up, but these are really old, really tough problems to deal with. Last week, someone reminded me of about a fake news attack from uh, Octavian, who faked a will from uh, Mark Antony because he wanted to raise military funding and support to go after Antony and Cleopatra. <laughs> this is not new stuff. It is really tough. And they are actually serious about it and doing something. You also want to be quiet about how you talk about it, because when you talk about techniques, the bad guys are listening to what you're saying. You'll see it pop up in black hat uh, discussion boards. So you really don't want to leak stuff before you're ready to uh, do something. Well, I, I, I take your point. No, it's not new. And I want to, I want to hear from Facebook. And just, but but <laughs> what, is, what has changed? In 2004, we had the Swift Boat versus the Bush National Guard story. Both were stories that had uh, some factual basis. They were important. They were fiercely disputed. The veracity was disputed. Uh, how does that, and, and yet you, they were each side accused the other of proffering phony, fake news. What, what has changed now? What is, what is different in the news environment now from 2004? Well, I think some parts of this are new and some parts of it are old, right? The problem of gullible people is timeless. There have been gullible people for a long time. There will always be gullible people. Anyone who has email and has received a forward from a relative understands this, right? It's hard to get those things to stop. Um, but I, I agree with Laura. I think one of the things that's new here are the platforms and the ease with which someone can 
can create a news story which, although it may sound fantastical to many of us, appeals to people's, you know, I feel, you know, a Trump supporter may be uh, inclined to believe things that enhance a particular narrative, and you can easily create something that enhances that narrative, um, which then gets propagated. Um, and I think the speed with which that can happen um, is something that's new, and you know, we don't have the same, same gateways controlling the media that we traditionally had. So, Adam, you're, spoken, you, yeah. you've been mentioned. Yeah. <laughs> How does it look from Facebook's so, side? So, two different things. Um, one on what's changed, I think the nature of how people consume information is continuing to change. Uh, and in news specifically, you're seeing more and more publishers, there's less and less barriers to entry, right? The cost of distribution is going closer and closer to zero. Uh, and there's more and more uh, competition, too. And it's anybody, the guy, where was he? And where in Southern California? He was in, yeah, he was outside LA. Yeah, so like, you can do that in a way that was harder uh, 12 years ago and much harder 12 years before that. And that's continuing to change. But I do think, in general, it's important to separate um, issues, because there are a bunch of different issues. Fake news is an issue. Uh, I think what we're really talking about here is confirmation bias is another issue. Uh, you know, hateful speech, which we almost touched on a second ago, is, a, is another issue. Um, and so I think that, yeah, you know, sort of um, how we think about things, I think at a high level we're trying to nurture an ecosystem, so that means to create value for people, but also to create value for publishers, uh, so that, you know, that can be symbiotic in some way. On the people side, we try to connect people with stuff that they find interesting, which is sort of our definition of quality. And on the publisher side, we try to create tools, and we announced the Facebook Journalism Project recently to create value for there. But in pursuing both, there's really two sides. There's trying to nurture the good, right? So helping people find stuff that they find meaningful uh, by ranking things better, better design, better helping people connect with sources. Uh, this guy hopefully was following NPR uh, on Facebook. Uh, but also to reduce uh, the negative, right? And so fake news is one type of negative content. Um, you know, there's uh, clickbait, there's uh, nudity, there's uh, hate speech, bullying, um, violent content, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so we try to divide things, and uh, or we think about things in those two different ways, and then we pursue those uh, problems very differently uh, because the nature of how you make progress is very different. So let me ask a crude question. Does Facebook make money from what we would consider fake news? Now, um, so I think there's three things to be concerned about um, for Facebook's perspective around the financial side of fake news. And I actually think it's super important because from what we can tell in our research, a lot of uh, fake news publishers are financially motivated. Um, they're spammers. They actually sometimes switch from one party to another. Um, so one thing that we worry about, but it uh, doesn't seem to be a real issue, is people don't use Facebook to advertise fake news very much. Um, it's just not an effective advertising platform for fake news. The cost of advertising is very different, et cetera. Two, we also want to make sure that they don't use our ad networks to sell ads on their sites. That also doesn't happen very much because we have strict policies and people have in place. We can actually manually approve advertisers, which is what we do. The thing that I think is where um, the, mon the financial value gets shifted to the um, fake news publishers uh, using Facebook, and this is something we need to further reduce, is getting free distribution. So posting something that's crazy, getting a lot of clicks on it, that takes a bunch of people to a website that's, I mean, you guys have probably seen this before, maybe it's a paragraph and then like 80 or 90% ads. We think of those as sort of ad farms. Mm -hmm. And that's not financially benefiting Facebook, but it is shifting financial value to fake news publishers, which is a bad thing. So we need to do what we can to reduce the distribution that fake news publishers get as close as we can to zero. And that's kind of what we were starting to try to do in December, and we have more work to do. Uh, can I just add something on the financial front? This sure. was an interesting thing that Justin Kohler told me, which was, um, you know, one of his sites was caught by Google, and they stopped running ads on his site. But the minute that happened, he, his inbox was filled with literally hundreds of offers from other places that would run ads on his sites. So, so the, it, unfortunately, the, the opportunity to run ads on your site is vast. It's yeah. not just the big companies. You, you can tell it's profitable bec from, because of the secondary effects. For example, there's a group, uh, I think it's Sleeping Giants. They've identified what they think is a fake news site. And every time they see an advertiser pop up on it, they contact the advertiser asking them to stop advertising there. And they claim, it's, uh, they claim it's working. A lot depends on how you define what uh, fake news or a fake news site is. But that, uh, that seems to be working. 
plus the ad uh, networks, the bigger ones like, uh, like uh, Google's in particular, they're being asked to stop uh, allowing advertising to be placed on uh, fake news sites. There's a uh, new ad network, that an, an aggregator that's focused on avoiding this thing that Ken Doctor just reported on. I'm giving Ken credit because I forget the name of the network. <coughs> um, and so things are happening which are improving things. Me, uh, I hate to be so critical as to name news ad networks by name, but I'm really tired of seeing ads from Taboola and Outbrain. And if that stopped appearing in my uh, reading on my phone, I'd be pretty uh, happy. So hel help me, somebody on the panel help me with this. I want to understand if I'm an enterprising young person in Macedonia and I want to make a bundle, right? So I come up with, I find some trending terms from Google, some things that are clearly of interest to vast numbers of people. And so I run a few stories, and one has Kanye West and Hillary Clinton in, in, in a, and possibly a love triangle. Uh, somebody else I can't think of at the moment, but, uh, and, and I know, and I post this story, and it's a complete, you know, fabrication. Nicely done, though, and I get pictures, I can do that too. And next thing you know, I have 500,000 people streamed there through somewhere. We're, and, and, and at that point, I have a serious, I have a serious footprint. And, and I, so how, who's making money from that? And who, is this Google, Google AdSense sending this? Is there some automated mechanism? It's just, it would be helpful, I think, if we all got to the same point in understanding the mechanics of how illicit gains are made on the internet thanks to fake news. I can take a pass at this. Okay. So if you are trying to make money off fake news, you actually probably won't start a website. You'll start many websites. You'll create many pages on Facebook. You'll create many accounts on Twitter, et cetera. Uh, you do this to diversify your risk, right? Because if you get shut down in one place, you don't get shut down everywhere else. You then um, try and create essentially an engine that churns out a lot of content. Uh, it's usually very short, it's usually very sensational, often it's deliberately fake and false. Um, you actually can sometimes actually, there are markets for this, you can actually go and pay $20 for a paragraph. Basically. And then you use uh, an ad network, which is basically uh, a middleman between you and advertisers, uh, and you basically then use that ad network to get ads on your web page. Usually, very low uh, CPM, CPC, very low cost ads. So, sort of, um, we're not yeah. talking about like brand advertising. If, if you go to a, a page and there's a story, and like the ads are like for special face cream that Ellen is using, or I don't know, you know, just like weird or <laughs> weird porn stuff. stuff. Yeah, Bad sign. it's it's actually low right. quality advertising. Yeah. Uh, and then what you do is you just keep creating content. And you do that in a bunch of different ways and you try to build up followings uh, and, and get clicks any way you can on any social media platform or through you know, email chains, which we don't talk about a lot and other things. And uh, what you need to do is you need to have, on average, you need to make more money per visit than it costs you to create content for all the visits you get for that piece of content. So if I paid you 20 bucks to write something crazy about Kanye and Hillary Clinton, whatever it was, that, and that cost me $20. I need to make more than $20 from all the people who visit that piece of content, on average. Uh, and it's just a machine. And what you're always looking for, and this is Craig's point before, is how to um, game all the platforms you can. So it's, an, it's a somewhat adversarial relationship. So like, you know, it's, like sp it's, it's spam, actually, is really what it is. And so like any other spam, if you, you prevent one type of behavior, they usually come up with another type of behavior. So one thing that could happen, theoretically, is if we managed all the platforms, managed to completely reduce fake news to zero, it's not like the incentives would go away. They would just find new ways of making money uh, that might not be fake news, that might be some other form of problematic content. So it's an ongoing, never-ending uh, relationship. Is that? It's a help. It, it, sounds, it sounds as if what you're describing are elements that are fundamental to the way the internet pays its way. These are not, the, the fake news purveyors have identified things that are not just incidental, they are integral to the way the, in, the internet is monetized. And this, if I could just read this quote from Evgeny Morozov in The uh, Guardian, the problem is not fake news, but the speed and ease of its dissemination. And it exists primarily because today's digital capitalism makes it extremely profitable. Look at Google and Facebook, sorry to produce and circulate false but click-worthy narratives. 
So I'd say it's a bit more general. The cost of distributing, informa distributing information has gone almost to zero. And by and large, it's a good thing, right? You, you can learn about, I have a kid. He's about to turn one. He was colicky. I actually spent a lot of time on the internet figuring out how do you sue the colicky baby, which, by the way, is not possible. Um, and like, so there's all sorts of good so about how bad was the advice you found? You know, <laughs> well, eventually I got to some like some some poor um, I think it was a father who was just like, look, you're just gonna have to deal with this. By the way, it gets way better at you know three months and you'll be fine. So just hang on, which was the best advice I got. Um, so in generally, I, th I think it's good that information is easier to access, but there are also uh, negative repercussions to your sort of introduction. And so then the question is, how do we address the negative? without uh, reducing the positive effects, which I think are also very real. I think this is one of the fundamental things that's different now. We've talked about what's different. I mean, fake news, misinformation, disinformation, that's been around forever, and it always will be. Uh, what has changed, I think, is precisely the fact that the cost of distribution has gone to zero. Basically, silicon and sand are, are now cost us nothing, and that's what we make CPUs and fiber optics out of. And so we can distribute information. And what that's enabled is that anybody can be a publisher. The world now is anybody can have a platform and be a publisher and distribute their information to anybody in the world at essentially zero cost. Not quite zero, but very low cost. And that's created a number of things. Let's think about the big platforms. I, I don't actually think the small fake news websites are that big a problem because they don't actually make that much money and they're not probably having that much influence. It's when they, they start to get distribution through the bigger, more reputable networks, when they start to take advantage of Facebook and others, Twitter and others, to get their distribution, that's when we start to be concerned, I think, much more. The, whether you call it Web 2.0, social media, user-contributed content, those platforms that depend on the users, as Laura said, bringing the content to it, that's really different than the way publishing used to be done. And it's different in an important way because the content platform providers now want to actually lower the barriers for people to bring content to them. They want to make it as easy as possible for people to publish. They're basically providing open publishing platforms where you can publish anything you want for free, and you want to attract that content. If you didn't have that coming in, you wouldn't have, a platform, you wouldn't have anything. At the same time, you want to keep out the manipulations, the spam, the uh, disinformation, but telling the difference is very hard. It, it's, it's very costly. It takes, it, you know, tell the difference. That's why I would say quality is so important. Actually, you need human intervention. When you've got 1.8 billion people putting content on the platform, figuring out how to screen out the bad content is very difficult, and that's what's changed. Well, it, it seems to me, I mean, you have what I was trying to say about Facebook being the problem. It's more that it's got an environment that's kind of squishy and nice, and you got the baby pictures and the dog pictures, and then somebody posts a fake news story amidst this very friendly, warm environment. And I think people's guard is almost down in an environment like that because it feels friendly, right? You got your friends there, you got your family there. And so, I don't, and I don't know what you do, what Facebook can possibly do when it is meant to be a platform where you can share things with your friends. And if you happen to be somebody who has bad information, um, it can easily spread like wildfire. Well. I'm uh, focusing right now on s less fighting fake news and more on, on supporting trustworthy journalism. There are trustworthy news sites out there which do a good job, like there's uh, ProPublica, uh, Mother Jones is actually much better than people know and even more centrist than people know. Consumer Reports is really good and they're all disclosed that I'm on that board. So on, on the one hand, you do what you can to support trustworthy journalism. On the other hand, there are pragmatic things you can do to uh, strike at uh, fake news. Again, the sleeping giants approach uh, is one approach to uh, fighting fake news, depriving fake news operators of advertising dollars. Another thing you can do in other ways is, uh, frankly, uh, cutting, uh, cutting the cord with respect to cable TV. There are fake news uh, networks which rely lot, not only on advertising, but on cable franchise fees. And if cable franchise fees, which sometimes run into the billions of dollars, if they don't have access to them anymore, then that deprives them of a big source of our revenue so that fake news is no longer as uh, profitable as it used to. In the process, we need to help reporters and news organizations provide trustworthy news. That's part of my uh, relatively new obsession about f uh, helping protect reporters from uh, 
harassment and cyberbullying, we also need to help trustworthy news organizations, the smaller ones, in the case of media lawsuits. And so people are beginning to float the ideas of much more affordable media lawsuit insurance. It's not a very exciting uh, topic intellectually, but if you're a reporter who's uh, sued or potentially sued by uh, bad actors, you really want affordable media lawsuit insurance. And I'll stop there, even though I can go on and on. Uh, well, I'll just yeah, I'll add two real quick. Just one to speak directly to you, I think, your question, one that's related. Uh, one thing you can do, actually, and I think that my feed is a lot of baby pictures because I have a kid, I have a bunch of friends with kids, et cetera. But actually, how people use Facebook varies a lot from mm -hmm. market to market, from community to community. So it's not always that. Either way, though, I think one thing platforms can do is provide more context about what people are reading. And fundamentally, I think that's part of what we're trying to do with the third-party fact-checking program, which is let you know that Snopes disputed this. But there's more types of content or context that we can surface to help make people, help people make informed decisions about what to trust, what to share in the first place. So that's an area that we're going to continue to work on. Another, though, is to try to go further upstream and try to prevent our, uh, uh, the quantity of fake news from entering the system in the first place. And I think this is where, and Craig just touched on this, disrupting the economic models are so important. If you can make it uneconomical, most of these spammers will go away. They'll do something else. Uh, and there's a bunch of different ways uh, that I think platforms can make it uneconomical for fake news publishers. Um, a lot of them use tip um, tactics like domain spoofing, like you know, abc.co instead of abc.com, or uh, that was actually one of Justin Kohler's sites. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, or redirect cloaking, so it says one link and it takes you to another, and takes you to another, and takes you to another. Um, so those types of tactics, I think, you know, you can build policies around and, and automate. The other thing you can do is, uh, which we haven't done a lot of yet, but it's an area I'm excited about, is take a look at the landing pages. If you go to a page and it's actually just 90% ads, that's a sign that's probably not a real publication. It's the Denver Guardian isn't actually a real publication, it was just a made up website. So these are the types of areas where I think we've done some work, but we've got a lot more work to do, and I think the other platforms are looking at it in a similar way. Let me pivot off some of the things that you've been saying, um, and, and let me suggest this, that um, Facebook, these various sites that we're talking about and deploring, they can post stories, they can draw readers, but they can't set agendas. And they have been reliant on mainstream, actual established news media to essentially weaponize fake news and to give it significance and to give it public importance. And I wonder if we could talk a little bit about what the media, the, by media I mean the media that, I'm, that we at the Graduate School of Journalism train our, our students to, to uh, take part in, the news media, what can they be, what are they doing wrong with respect to fake news? How should they be handling it differently from the way they are? And how can they avoid being unwitting accomplices in the, the kind of pollution, if you like, contamination of public discourse? I, I mean, I, I think one problem I see in the media is that sometimes when something is floating around, they report on it or they even give it, you know, attention and I think that doesn't help is that this is my opinion that you, you actually start to give it credence when you report on it so that would be one place but I, I think part of the problem too is though you have a public that wants to believe certain things and I don't uh, you know did fake news sway the election or did the people who but read sort of depends what stories, you mean by fake news. Yeah, well, uh, you, I, I mean <laughs> stories like the one that I tracked down, you know, s that fed into this narrative that's out there that the Clintons were responsible for the deaths of all these people, which is in fact uh, a narrative that is floating around on, on the right in this country. Um, and if you're inclined to believe that and you see this story, it just reaffirms what you believe. Or if these stories weren't out there, would you stop would no longer believe that. I don't, you know, were you going to vote for Trump no matter what? I, and that's a question that I still have, you know. Ha, what impact is this phenomena actually having? 
Yeah, I have to say I tend to think that our concern over this is overblown and driven in part by the fact that these stories like the ones you reported are just so shocking, right? It's novel that someone can be so morally bankrupt and then have such power to influence the media narrative. I mean, I think the other thing that it's worth paying attention to is what we really want companies like Facebook to be doing here. I happen to like Facebook's relatively gentle approach to this, right? To try to label certain stories as potentially <coughs> fake um, without taking them down. Because I think if we'd been having a conversation about Facebook and free speech a year ago, the conversation we would have been having would be quite different. It would be about how much power do we want a company, right, a corporation, uh, with an algorithm that's not public to manipulate what the public can see, right? And now we're all sitting here in Berkeley, you know, with concern over conservative <coughs> media, fake stories, uh, potentially influencing the election in a way that we may not like. Um, but is that the, the, the bigger concern? And then how much do we really want corporations to use the tremendous power they do have over what people read um, to manipulate that content because of what it says? But haven't they been doing that forever? I mean, that's, we, we've gone from basically a world where there were gatekeepers, and that's the way it was, to one where there are no gatekeepers. And so, I'm not really sure that, you know, what's new is that we don't have gatekeepers. And I think we're trying to look at what, it, what is the impact of that. I think, I think part of the problem is that we spend so much time wishing or thinking we're still in that world where we have gatekeepers, and so we look to the gatekeepers for solutions. And you asked, what can the traditional media do? So, for instance, a responsible journalistic organization like NPR. I, I think there's some things it can do, but I'd actually like to expand that to, for instance, what can the Graduate School of Journalism or Berkeley do? We've been talking about the news providers and the industry that flows information. I think a lot of the thing we need to address are the consumers, the readers of information. We're going to have fake news always, and because of the zero cost of information distribution, it's not going to go away. We can always raise the costs of providing fake news and lower the benefits and, and moderate it to some extent, but there's always going to be disinformation out there and manipulation and infomercials and so forth and so on. What we need to really do is educate folks much better to be better consumers of information. We have not been in this country addressing information literacy nearly as much as we need to, given the flood of information. We've gone from a world of scarce information controlled by largely responsible gatekeepers whose reputations depended on it, to overly abundant information where everybody has to now be their own filter, has to be their own editor. And we haven't been teaching our students at any level our population to be good self-editors. You know, th there's a Stanford study that probably most people are aware of that came out a few weeks ago that looked at high school students and found that going into college, that they, most of them, 85% of them, couldn't tell the difference between a genuine news story and a paid promotion. There are always going to be paid promotions out there. We can't make those go away. We have to make sure that citizens can distinguish between them uh, and recognize what is paid content and what is actual journalistic reporting. I'm, that, that's a good example. I mean, there's a whole industry out there that's devoted to obfuscating that distinction. Yeah, so it is, of course. It's, so that kind of ignorance on the part of the reader is a produced outcome. Uh, speaking on behalf of news consumers, <laughs> uh, I want to be able to pay for news that I can trust. <clears throat> what I'd like to, in a news aggregator, to see would be, let's say, a checkbox which says, only show me news from news organizations that have publicly committed to trustworthy behavior. That would be like an ethics code, uh, diversity policy, and uh, you know, committed to a good accountability and a corrections policy. Because people do make mistakes no matter what happens. And then I want an organization of uh, fact checkers, maybe an international network like the one run by uh, folks like uh, Pointer Institute and the American Press Institute. So I want to be able to say, only show me stuff from organizations that promise to do trustworthy news and that have a good record. And you know, that's enough for me speaking in a simple-minded way as a news consumer. That's what I want to pay for. I already do pay for that. I'm looking to pay a lot more for that in a number of different ways, which I don't want to be, uh, I don't want to prematurely announce. I would do things like sponsoring more, uh, more in the way of pledge drives, if only they would use my favorite theme um, but the idea is that I am putting my money where my mouth is. A lot of other media impact funders are looking to do this in conjunction with the API uh, code where they're looking into uh, the ethics of funding nonprofit journalism. That's actually a thing, and it's a very recent thing, weeks ago. But the idea is that I do think people are willing to uh, pay for trustworthy news, 
And frankly, uh, there's a lot of people who are willing to put their money where their mouth is in a big way. And that's supporting groups like uh, ProPublica and NPR. But, but some people think Breitbart is trustworthy news. You know, um, I, or Fox is trustworthy news. People have different ideas, and other people think NPR is trustworthy then news. Then let's see who will put their uh, money where their mouth is. On the other hand, again, there's the folks, again, including sleeping giants, who are telling advertisers, hey, if you, do you want to be associated with untrustworthy news? Let's see how that works out. And again, uh, let's see how well uh, Pledge Drive works out particularly if KQED will allow me to use my uh, favorite theme. <laughs> so, so, Craig, the idea, uh, the idea is to threaten advertisers with reputational harm. Doesn't want anyone to ask you what, uh, what that joke is? <laughs> well, what I propose to KQED and others for Pledge Drive, my theme would be, please, dear God, make it stop. <laughs> but they, no one will go for it <laughs> yet. So, so let me, the idea of Sleeping Giant is to threaten advertisers with some sort of reputational harm oh. in exchange for advertising on uh, these undesirable nothing, sites. Nothing that dramatic or negative. They're just saying to uh, news sites, hey, do you really want to be associated with this? <clears throat> and that's constructive and positive. And I'm Mr. Positive. <laughs> but but it, it does sort of open the door for a criticism and for sort of action taken against sites because you don't like what they're doing or don't like the messages they're showing, not because those messages are corrupt or flawed or uh, deserving of a lack of trust. I mean, people would go after Breitbart. A good bit of what's on Breitbart is reported. It's reported out. It looks like journalism, tastes like journalism. It comes from a different ideological perspective. But that doesn't mean it is something that is that should be destroyed. It's kind of part of the ideology, it's part of the landscape of public discourse. But yet, I can imagine a good many people, some of whom are here tonight, who would disagree with that and would think that shutting down a site like Breitbart is an awfully good idea. So I mean, I, I worry about the ethical, I worry about using the ethics as an instrument of kind of political uh, uh, reprisal. Ed, you seem to have this obsession with Breitbart and you're the one who's, uh, who's brought it up. Me, I'd say boycotts of any sort, that's a two-edged sword. Uh, people do have to make ethical decisions uh, about that. Me, after uh, doing customer service on the net for over 20 years, I can assure folks that there are a lot more people of goodwill than there are people of bad will out there. You'll forgive my uh, <coughs> faith, it's somewhat naive, but the deal is that I've been observing human behavior on the net for a long time and I actually have a lot of confidence in humanity. Uh, but the thing is that we need to uh, give people the tools that they need to uh, act out of goodwill. Understood. Let, let me just, before we go to questions from the audience, let me ask about the dangers of overreaction. And I think, Catherine, you brought up the possibility that this is sort of overblown. I'm not sure I entirely agree. But I have some fear. When I read that Google says, it will take steps to keep its ads off, quote, pages that misrepresent, misstate, or conceal information about the publisher, the publisher's content, or the primary purpose of the site. Now, if you go back and carefully kind of parse that sentence, that's a fairly, that's a fairly broad mandate to, uh, to, 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 to basically perform capital punishment on sites that might expose Google to criticism or might embarrass it in a corporate way. And I just worry a little bit that we might be, there might be such a broad brush and the kind of public sort of unhappiness with what they're seeing in fake news might be, might motivate and might propel a reaction that goes considerably farther than any of us are comfortable with. Boy, you're, you're good at the sound by capital punishment on, uh, on websites. Um, <laughs> well, if, you're not, if, you're, if you're on the third page of Google results, forget about it. If you're not well, on the first page, you're <clears> in trouble. Well, now you're talking about the, where you're located in the results. But if you're talking about the advertising model, as was pointed out earlier, there are lots of advertisers out there and lots of advertising channels. Google is not the only one. Mm -hmm. And if they start excluding large swaths of content from their advertising, there are going to be plenty of other people who swoop in as long as people want to go to those sites. So as long as it's 
private individuals and private organizations exercising their right to decide what information they're going to value, that doesn't worry me. What worries me is if we start to say, oh, the government should come in and should decide what news is good for us. We've seen countries that operate that way. I don't want to be living in one of them. I, I had a, a, a Chinese general. I was in China, and I, I got an opportunity to have an off-the-record conversation with this Chinese general. And um, I, asked, I asked her, how much does the People's Liberation Army uh, concern itself with social media? And um, she said, gave me some vague answers, and then looked at me and smiled and said, ha, what do you think of Twitter revolution now? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I mean, I think from the perspective of some of these other countries, they are terrified of exactly what this unleashes. And um, there's part of me, I have moments where I'm like, I kind of know what they're saying. I mean, there is, there is a sense that this does create an awful lot of instability and uncertainty of what's true and it can be used against people. There's, there's, it's, this is, an incre this is a, a hell of an issue. It's, I think it's a really difficult, difficult, challenging issue for, for our time. You mentioned, if you would put up your hands, we have two people with microphones and we'll uh, call on you for questions. So, uh, in the front, one, and I'm gonna do three at a time. Um, <laughs> two and three in the back. Yeah, you. The one turning. Yeah, you. Okay. Uh, and I just while you do this, I just want to share something <clears throat> that the Chinese uh, stated. Their their uh, cyberspace authority stated uh, issued a policy saying it is forbidden to use hearsay to create news or use conjecture and imagination to distort the facts, which is hearsay. It's pretty broad. Wow. Yeah, hearsay. Okay, yes. Um, I was hoping you could discuss uh, the fact that the term fake news is already being uh, perverted. Uh, President Trump accused uh, some major media outlets of releasing fake news. There's been a sort of a, uh, now the, the term fake news is being used for articles that are written that a personal, a, you know, a politician doesn't like. And I think that makes everything more complicated because it's just a way of uh, sort of, you know, eliminating uh, people's paying attention to real fake news and just being able to dismiss hard reporting going on. And I think in some ways that's even more of an issue than fake news on the internet because unlike what Laura said, I think that the, the, there's, People who get fake news on Facebook, sometimes in their communities, they're alerted to the fact it's fake news. I don't think consumers are 100% stupid. I think they recognize it a lot. I think, um, so, you know, I, I don't think it's, uh, I mean, it, clearly it's a big issue, but I do think people are aware of it out there and are taking steps to point it out. But with Trump going around saying bad news about me is fake news, I think that's a huge issue. A constructive approach is, again, to uh, promote the trustworthy stuff. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I remembered from uh, Sunday school, it's better to uh, light a candle than curse the darkness. So the term fake news is uh, abused. Uh, it has emotional re uh, resonance that doesn't come from, let's say, a gullible news or anything like that. So we're still going to use the term fake news, but let's support the trustworthy stuff. Like, Pledge week. <laughs> I, I think that there, this is a, a tremendous problem, I, I think. It's sort of like my, I was saying this earlier, my sister used to play, my older sister used to play this game with me where I would say something and she'd say it at the same time and then th what it, would, it, it would just make you shut up. And I feel a little bit like, you know, it's like, you say fake news, I'm gonna say fake news too. And now everybody's saying fake news and that is kind of crazy. I think some of it, I would like to see perhaps a different approach to sometimes to coverage. We tend to move from event to event to event. And recently I was with a group of people, another group of people who were talking about this phenomena. And maybe we need to think about um, sticking with stories and covering them as they unfold instead of just jumping from, you know, that day's thing. You know, so if we're going to follow, you know, the Health and Human Services Department, just make that an ongoing thing that we're covering rather than just going for the day's soundbite. 
Um, and maybe some of this is going to involve a different approach to news and rethinking how we cover it as well. One small thing I'd add is um, I think that it's definitely true that the term or the phrase fake news is being wildly, you know, it's being distorted. It's being used for more and more things. Uh, and your example is a good one, but there's actually many I've seen over the last couple of weeks or months. Uh, I would say that it's not totally new. One of the things that we look for, so on Facebook, we let people report things as fake news. We've done that for a long time. Uh, and if you know, if you go in and you look at the reports, people have reported things that they disagreed with long before this election. Uh, so that distortion, though I think significantly larger to your point today, is, is, is not new entirely. So I think what's important is that if you are you know, involved in the issue in some way, as a publisher, as a platform, as a consumer, it's just critical that you're very clear about what you mean when you say fake news, and that you don't let all of the sort of conflation <laughs> prevent you from making progress on whatever it is that you feel is your sort of responsibility. Um, because it's, it is being distorted, but it, you know, it's still an issue, and I think that we each, you know, each of us in our different ways need to uh, sort of continue to pursue it. We go to the second question. Yes. Actually, I was going to say something very similar to what that other person just asked, but I'll, just a quick comment and a question. Uh, the comment is, I, I too have some optimism, optimism and faith that people who innocently pass fake news will get better at not doing it, just like we don't send emails anymore about Nigerians wanting to send us fortunes. Uh, as we become aware of the issue, I think it will get better. Uh, the, the question that I had uh, is, is similar to what that person said, uh, that when, when Trump called out uh, CNN and called it a fake news site, uh, I, I thought that was really dangerous. I mean, cl clearly the, the story that he was the, referring to, the one about the Russians, uh, the Russian report uh, of Trump's behavior while in Russia, the, the story was in a large sense true. I mean, that, that is, there was such a report. The, alley, the, the, the origins of the report were as CNN stated it. Uh, the general nature of the allegations were what, what were stated. The, the idea that it was unverified and, and possibly, if not probably, largely untrue was clearly stated. And so there wasn't really anything untrue about the story, uh, but by characterizing uh, by, by focusing on the fact that the, that the report itself might have been untrue and saying therefore it's fake news set, sets up a situation where now not only are you muddying the meaning of the term fake news, but you're possibly, uh, to, to be extreme about castrating a news site like CNN to the extent that, that Trump can get people to believe that CNN is culpable of fake news, it then makes the entire network um, uh, untrustworthy. And you can then say, oh, yeah, they're, they're the network that posts fake news. We don't have to believe anything they say. And it becomes very difficult then to decide who, who you can believe. And I, mean, I guess my question is, what can you do about that? Espe especially when it's the president that's involved. I, I agree that this is really awful, and it's, it goes to the, the problem I mentioned before, I think. We're going to have disinformation and manipulative information and bad persuasion always, and in fact, we're going to have more of it because it's getting cheaper and easier to distribute it. What we need are discerning, critical thinking citizens, people who actually pay attention to where the news is coming from, where the information is coming from, and make judgments about that. And something like what Trump did is anti-literacy. It's telling people you believe what you want to believe and, and don't, and standing up representing an institution or about to represent an institution uh, that's very highly trusted, the US government, he's saying, don't worry about it. If you don't like it, it's not true. This is a really serious problem that we've been facing for some time in this country. Anti-science is another part of it. We have an enormous number of people who tell us we should be anti-scientific because we don't like what science is telling us, so it must be false. This is terrible. If our institutions are telling us to be anti-literate and anti-science and anti-knowledge, that's really dangerous. The solution isn't for the government or any other institution to come in and tell us what news is correct or what information is correct. It's to help people actually value and celebrate information literacy and critical thinking so that people learn early in school and throughout their lives to actually make judgments and not accept these uh, statements. And for our, our own institutional leaders to be actually trying to undercut that, I think, is horrifying. Well, I would just dissent a little bit in the sense that what Trump was saying was that the underlying veracity of the report the intelligence people were passing along was non-existent. So he can't very well welcome the fact that they were briefing the president and president-elect on, on reality <coughs> that did not, in his view, in his position was didn't exist. 
and that the media have some responsibility to determine not just whether somebody said something to some, someone else, but whether what they said was true. And he, taking the position it wasn't true, so he, he, you know, he doesn't have a very strong hand in this one, but he tried to play it. Um, I think uh, America's uh, foremost uh, media ethics critic uh, provided a commentary and solution to this. In the one case, he points out that uh, when you're talking about politics in the press, it's kind of like visiting the uh, monkey cage at the zoo. I won't deliver this very well, but you know, you look at the monkey cage and they're flinging feces at each other, and you think, uh, well, they shouldn't do that. But what you really think is that what the zookeeper should say is bad monkey. And that's the role of the press in this environment. He got to the point where we provided a solution to the problem in a segment called CNN Leaves It There, where he pointed out that uh, a politician just came out and lied to the reporter. It was already well known to be a black and white lie. The reporter was taken aback, obviously knew uh, that this was a lie, but he said, well, we got, to, uh, we got to leave it there. And so you can look up this segment called CNN Leaves It There, uh, Daily Show, about uh, eight years ago. And again, this is this guy saying this is probably the most effective media ethics commentator in the country. And if you Question. don't get the joke, it's John Stewart. <laughs> Question. So I have a, it, I'm Tracy Taylor from Berkeley Side, a local news um, site, which I hope would be qualified as not fake news. Um, <laughs> Catherine brought up the, um, que the question about Facebook. If we'd had this conversation a year ago, we'd be talking maybe about them censoring or curating our news in some way. Um, I think that that argument has passed a long time ago because it's, it's, it's been well documented. We, own, we all only see a very tailored, customized um, news in our own feeds. What I, as a Hillary Clinton supporter, was reading on Facebook was totally different from what a Trump supporter was reading, for example. But I'm interested to know from you, um, when did Facebook start seeing this rise in fake news on Facebook? How long ago before the election? And why did it take you so long to actually address it? I think, at least publicly, you only started saying you were addressing it after the election. Sure. So we've been working on fake news as part of a broader effort around quality and integrity work on news for a long time. So for instance, like you've been able to report something as fake news for, I think, uh, years. Uh, I think two years. We actually I, did I did a report on it, so I know you're, this yeah. is true. Yeah, yeah we even yeah. actually. <laughs> this is, this is true news. This is totally yeah. true. <laughs> He's not just spinning it, it's been, true. You've been fact-checked in real time. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> um, uh, I think about a year and a half ago, or actually two years ago, now, we actually even announced publicly a change we made to try to <coughs> address fake news. Um, now, that said, the amount of attention in the wake of the US election has been enormous, and we try to always listen to our community, so the amount of intensity and the amount of work has increased. I just want to be super transparent <coughs> about that. Um, uh, but in terms of how much we've seen, we actually haven't seen um, a ton of uh, increase uh, around the election. The, the amount of fake news on the platform actually, and I'm not trying to diminish the importance of the issue, is relatively small. It's a very small percentage of what people see. It should be smaller. We should get it as close to zero as possible. I agree there will always be so disinformation out there, so I want to be realistic, but I think that you know, as long as there's an issue, we should try to address it as much as possible. Um, but more broadly, I think the question is like, how can we make sure that we're creating value for the people who are uh, using our services on a regular basis and create value for publishers? And, I think fake news is an important issue, but sort of part of a, uh, a bigger set of challenges that we have. Um, and I, so I, I, though I appreciate the amount of attention fake news is getting, because I like the fact that, uh, that there's scrutiny and that that, that, that that motivates us, that makes us excited to go to work. And uh, it took us a few, uh, a few months, uh, about two months after the swell of activity to really get something out there. Um, uh, I also want to make sure that we don't lose sight of the other things that are important. And then to address your specific question about why did it take so long, um, actually for us, uh, you know, two months in the wake of the elections are actually even less because it was before uh, the break and the, the election was the 9th, the 11th, does anybody remember? Uh, we wanted to be really careful uh, getting third-party fact-checking organizations online, working out that the Pointer Institute would have the right policies that people would have to adhere to, making sure that the system would actually do the right thing and we wouldn't start marking the wrong things as fake news. Um, 
All that was stuff that we wanted to be really careful about. So we were trying to balance speed and um, responsibility, and that's, that's always our challenge. Um, and the last thing I'll add is there's two sides to all these things, right? There's, uh, which I think you're alluding to, which is, you know, if we start being more, having more stringent policies around what content is shared, we start to get dangerously close to impinging on speech and other issues. And I actually don't think it's gone away. We actually received a lot of criticism just a few months ago about uh, mistakenly taking down the Terran War photo uh, from um, uh, a Norwegian publisher, I believe. And that's wh which photo is this? Uh? There's a, is a historical photo about um, the war in Vietnam. Oh, okay. With a, it's, a, it's a series of children, and one of them is... Right, the Nick Art yeah. picture from... Yeah, and so, again... Won a Pulitzer Prize. Yes. Took it down because it was a naked girl. A naked underage girl. Right. Uh, and um, so that was a lot of criticism on the other side just recently. Uh, so we're always going to try to balance that. We're going to err on trying to um, let people express themselves uh, because we're concerned about the same things that you're raising. Uh, but we're also going to try to be as responsible as we can about addressing problematic. Was, was that taken down by a person or by an automated response? So the way it works is very different than I think, well, than, uh, than, than publications work. So a publication, um, like if you were the New York Times, the decision about posting that photo would be made in the sort of page one meeting at 9.30 in the morning, probably. And there'd be like 10, 20 people that would argue about it. For us, that gets posted, it could be tens of thousands of times. You know, in this case, no, just a few. Then it gets reported. And then we have people actually review the reports and make sure the reports actually violate our community standards which are public and there are things around like no nudity, no violence, et cetera. Uh, and that can happen relatively quickly, um, whereas changing the policy itself can take a little bit longer. So in this case, it was reported, it was taken down, uh, and we, we've since uh, essentially changed our policy to make a newsworthy exception for photos like this photo. Uh, and so we're always learning, we wanna hear more, uh, and always just trying to get better at these things. Can I just ask a, a quick follow-up on that? Didn't Facebook take people out of the equation uh, after there was criticism from conservative groups that uh, there was a bias within Facebook of taking down conservative news, and they took people out of the equation and brought it back to just algorithms? No, so, so, so not, for, not for newsfeed, not for uh, problematic content and reports. What happened is we, um, for trending, which is different than newsfeed, it's that sort of box on the left side of the, of the web page. Uh, we used to have people write these summaries for each report. Uh, and we um, tried to find a way to do that uh, more sort of algorithmically. So what we do now is actually we source a headline from, a, you know, from an actual publisher as opposed to having people write those headlines themselves. So okay, yeah. so questions, uh, one, uh, two, and three. Three. So, Sherilyn, please. Okay. Um, my question is sort of like what Francis said at first, but it's really an incredibly brilliant strategy, it seems, and I hate to say even the T word, but the idea of, of uh, you know, saying, oh, well, this is fake news. It's almost like a playground strategy, you know, where like someone, someone's doing something and you call them that and then they call it to you back. And then if you react, then you're doing this, you know, and it's just like this sort of cycle. And so it seems like the only way that it's, it's being responded to, you know, the people who are, you know, on most of our sides of the aisle, you know, we would, you know, we're appalled, right? We're all appalled. We're saying like what I'm saying. And then on the other side, they just completely believe it. And so, you know, I suppose media literacy, is that the way to do it? Can that happen quickly, you know, fast enough? I mean, you know, it, it's just that everyone's talking to its own side, and of course there is a confirmation bias, but, you know, they're really playing on that big time. So that was my question. I don't know if there are further comments on it, but there's other questions as well, so. I, I think I see a tremendous hunger in the news industry to do this. The thing holding it back maybe is a bit of fear uh, again, of uh, harassment and bullying, and also uh, against, well, we could call it harassment and bullying uh, in the legal system, the litigation stuff. So I see people beginning to move on it. I think it's happening faster than I thought. That's the silver cloud in the electoral lining. You know, the news industry has the idea that something needs to be done. Uh, there's one guy who was involved in an early phase in this who said that if we don't all hang together, we're going to hang separately. And so I do see hope with this. Things can happen uh, for that matter. One of, the, yeah, one of the efforts in this, again, is the trust project. 
And if anyone here wants to talk to Sally from the Trust Project, she's running at Sally Lehrman, we can get, uh, we can, uh, get you uh, an interview with her fairly quickly, especially if she takes that empty chair up there. Uh, but the thing is that things are happening, and that's why I'm uh, beginning to obsess about the issue of harassment and cyberbullying, in not only in news media, but in general, but in news media in particular. Monica. Uh, I want to pick a tiny bone with you, Ed, um, because I think what happened at the uh, Trump presser last week was actually something qualitatively new on this front. And you know, it seems to me um, that you know, at this moment on January 19th, 2017, we're dealing with a lot of things we've dealt with in the past, but also new problems. Um, what happened there was, you know, CNN and Mother Jones, you know, had covered the story well before the election, reported on the existence of these memos from this former intelligence professional. Did not say what they contained, but said that they existed and that they had been passed to the FBI. BuzzFeed published the memos. What Trump did at the presser was, you know, when, when Jim Acosta got up to ask his question, said, not you, not you, you are fake news. Your organization is terrible, quiet. Like all these things in a row sort of deserve a little unpacking. Um, and so what I'm curious from each of you is how, what you identify as the qualitatively new thing that's going on um, in this space and whether you see a qualitatively new doable um, remedy. Um, Craig has already laid out his, um, so he gets a pass, <laughs> but I'm curious what the rest of you have to say. I, I, you know, something when, when we were talking about it came to mind. The fact that he called CNN out in a press conference was definitely new. However, the Obama administration initially didn't want to give, uh, as I recall, interviews to Fox News because they didn't like Fox News and people were all over the Obama administration for this. So in that sense, it's just a, it's a degree of difference. I mean, I don't think we've ever seen that where um, a president called somebody out like that. and. From what I'm hearing, um, CNN at one point came to Fox News's defense over something with Trump, and Fox News has come back and been supportive of CNN, and so it seems like there is an effort right now for journalistic organizations to stick together to defend each other's right to report the news, and that seems to me right now a very important thing that is going on at this moment to resist that kind of singling out that, the Trump, that Donald Trump did. I guess I, I agree. It is true, of course, the administrations have played favorites forever. Uh, it did feel as if what Trump was doing was criminalizing editorial judgment and in a way to banish, you're, you're off the table, you're no longer, I'm not considering you a journalist anymore, you're proffering something else. And that seemed to me to ratchet up the, uh, the combat, if you like. Uh, question, where, uh, yes. Ma'am, you recently, uh, you mentioned China uh, a minute ago, and I recently, one of the other students from the journalism school, went to China on a, uh, sorry, went to China on a, an exchange with other journalists and, uh, and entrepreneurs, and one of the things that they talked about was the Great Firewall. You know, where Google and Facebook are blocked within that entire country. You can't even access that type of information. And now earlier we spoke of um, groups, organizations that would help filter or create filters for the consumer on what media they may or may not be able to consume. Where do we lie in, you know, getting the right media and trampling on our own First Amendment rights to ensure that we are blocking the wrong people and the right people in? Well, one of the things that I've found heartening about this debate is virtually no one has suggested that a government-imposed solution is a good idea here. We have a robust First Amendment protection, and although there are narrow categories of speech that are unprotected, the Supreme Court has said, you know, quite recently in a case dealing with the Stolen Valor Act, right, a case involving claiming that you um, have won an honor that you did not win, um, that <coughs> speech cannot be uh, outside the First Amendment merely because it is false, right? There has to be something in addition to that. Um, and I think anyone who doubts uh, that the government should not be involved should at least try to go through the exercise of what exactly it is that they want the government to do, right? Do you want Congress to pass a law? 
prohibiting falsehoods in certain areas, right? If not, do you want them to say false speech is impermissible, leaving it to prosecutors to decide what to deal with that? When you go down that thought exercise, I think it's clear that a government solution doesn't make a lot of sense. And so, you know, we're left with intermediaries trying to deal with this. Um, and I personally like, you know, the approach that Facebook has taken of labeling speech rather than um, rather than uh, censoring it, because I think uh, because we do have a different First Amendment tradition here. But just, just to goad you a little bit on this, if, I, if my website is starved of traffic and forced to shut down because of something Google does, how much comfort am I supposed to derive from the fact that it wasn't the government that did it? Well, but 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 I think I you know at least I hope I'm I'm saying that that's a concern, right? Um, I think we should be concerned, as I was saying earlier, about how much we rely on intermediaries and how much we want them to suppress speech in the name of combating false news because, um, because there are these choke points for speech, right? The internet intermediaries are the payment card companies are the same way, right? If you use them to try to, to, try to cut off payment as was done with WikiLeaks, right? Um, to certain news sources. Um, and so, yeah, it doesn't matter to you as the website owner whether it's the government or someone else, you still can't get the traffic that you were looking for. Uh, three more questions, yes, you, um, you, and in the back, uh, yes, the uh, man with the glasses. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> this is like a precision machine. <laughs> it's hard. Uh, if you have a microphone, go ahead. Okay. Um, in his 2015 book, The Devil's Chessboard, David Talbot, the founder of Salon.com, uses declassified public records to trace a, a long history of the New York Times basically allowing the CIA to plant stories. For example, um, they handpicked a journalist for the Times to send to Congo to cover Patrice Lumumba, who invented stories about torture chambers and political assassinations and stuff like this. I think you could also draw a pretty straight line from their coverage of the Gulf of Tonkin incident to their coverage of WMDs in Iraq, for example. Um, so I was wondering, first of all, on what, on what grounds can you really draw a distinction between those falsified and planted stories and what we're discussing here today as fake news? And secondly, what can we do to combat or push back against false stories coming from mainstream or trustworthy news organizations? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> Who wants to who wants to have at it? <laughs> the uh, if a uh, news organization signs up with this project to follow through with uh, corrections and accountability, you uh, tell them, hey, this was uh, not factual. Here's the evidence, and then you see the results, uh, give them a chance, and then uh, publish it. Normally. Uh, of course, you'll just be publishing something which say how wonderful they were about fixing the article. Yeah, you, so I'm Mr. Positive. You've really, you've identified a, an area of real frailty and vulnerability of the press. Mm -hmm. uh, if you've been lied to uh, by, an, by a source you've pledged confidentiality to, blowing the whistle on that source becomes ethically extremely problematic. And so government lies delivered under those terms become extremely difficult to expose. But I think it, it's still worth, I think, distinguishing between what you're talking about and the fake news that we've been discussing. This falls within the bailiwick of reporters negotiating and trying to sort of confirm the veracity of information they're getting from sources. What we're talking about now is the deliberate fabrication of information uh, by, by the essentially the, the equivalent of reporters acting for sort of personal benefit because that fabrication is extremely profitable, extremely useful, and as a, as a civic consequence of that, a great many people go around believing things that aren't true. So the ultimate, the result of what you're describing and what we've been discussing is very much the same, which is people believing things that aren't the case. And then and that, and they have a common dysfunction, and I agree with that. But I think that reporters are in a far better position, even though they are hoodwinked, you don't have to, they, they are misled, they are deceived, they're in a better position because that's their job, is to try to determine the veracity of the information they're given. So I see where you're going with it, but it's a kind of a different, 
and continuing problem that journalism faces. Uh, yeah. Can I add to that, Rupert? I think that it's fundamentally a more challenging issue. It's a related issue. We can argue if it's the same or different, but that might be the most important thing. I think the question is how do you address it? I think what you're pointing out if I, is that, you know, saying that the New York Times is trustworthy in this case like wouldn't have helped, which just points to the fact that we need multiple approaches to the same problem. Yeah. I think information literacy is an important one, right? A skeptical reader can uh, ask questions, look at what the sources are, which are cited, et cetera. I think skeptical journalists as well, which, you know, whether they're blowing whistles or just raising questions, is also uh, an important piece. And then I think dialogue, right? You can talk with people that you know or people <coughs> that you think are experts and see whether we facilitate it on a platform like Facebook or just in person about, you know, why you may or may not want to believe this thing. And the, an active debate there is really, really healthy. And those are parallel. Uh, tracks to you know trustworthy labels or sort of reputations at the uh, publication level, uh, and I think a lot of this is just because you need you just need a multiple prong approach. Question: uh, Does anybody have a microphone? Ah. Yeah. Yes, I wanted to know if it's true that right wing uh, fake news uh, generates more revenue than left wing fake news. <laughs> I will say that Justin Kohler, the gentleman that I tracked down, claimed that it did, that he tried to um, come up with fake left-wing news stories and they just didn't do as well, so he stopped doing it. But that's all I, I, I don't, how do you prove that? I, I don't know. That's just what he told me. Uh, hello. So um, beyond the financial motivations, there can be broad political and intellectual impacts of face new, uh, fake news. So um, it can extend like virally far beyond any retraction or correction that's issued afterwards. So uh, one issue or one idea is to like message people who saw the original story or derived story to try and curtail the impact of fake news. Um, and I was wondering if you had any ideas about this or plans for uh, trying to help this issue. So this is for me? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I actually think that um, there's, two, there's two ways to approach that. One is to let people know retroactively through, you know, um, maybe if they read it, maybe if they shared it, et cetera. Uh, and we're looking into ideas like that. The other is to just try and, uh, you know, move further upstream, either react more quickly um, or uh, prevent it from entering the system in the first place by disrupting the financial incentive. Um, so I think. You know, you want to you want to make sure that as little comes into the system as possible, and then when it happens, you need to react as quickly as you can. And if it's if you didn't find it until later, then you need to consider uh, letting people know. And the question is who and how. Uh, I don't know if we'll do that, but it's certain, certainly something that we're considering. Thanks. So I'm Sally Lehrman, and I lead the Trust Project. Thanks for the shout out, Craig. He's a funder, and um, we're trying to to work on the positive end. We're trying to work on the positive end in the sense of helping people identify quality news. But what I wanted to ask you about was today BuzzFeed reported on a survey that they had done of over a thousand people asking where they got their news and whether they trusted it. Most people in the survey, not to, to as you might expect, do get it from Facebook, get their news from Facebook. Most people also said that they do not trust the news they get on Facebook. <laughs> so my question is, what, is this a good or a bad thing? Is this, could this be part of what is undermining trust in the news? And if it is, then either way, what can we do about it? I can take it, but I have to speak <laughs> I, 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 I'm happy it's, to. Well, it's, it's I, I mean, I, it. I think you have an opinion. I, no, I don't actually okay. on this. I'm not really. I'm not really sure. It's sure. an interesting conundrum. I, I just don't. I don't know what to make of survey results like that, <laughs> <laughs> because there's clearly cognitive dissonance here. You know, this is where I get my news, but I don't believe it. I, what kind of a fool do you take me for? And, and I wonder whether that's become a cultural trope, where of course I consume lots of news, but I don't believe a word they say, and yet it shapes my actions. It shapes my worldview. It does, has all the effects of news that I would consider trustworthy. Somehow, somebody who, anybody who would say, oh, of course I believe what I read in the New York Times, it's a great newspaper. People would look at you, they'd walk away. <laughs> if you're in a bar, they'd move down a couple stools because they'd think you're, you know, you're, you're a fool. So I, I just wonder whether there is a larger kind of uh, 
mistrust in major institutions that you're seeing a portion of, it doesn't have to do with the fact that what they read on Facebook, they fundamentally disbelieve. Well, I, I should clarify, but that's an important point, but the, the numbers, the percentages of people who trusted news on, from their print, from their newspaper, and from the tele their television news was much higher. And I agree, I think the survey had some faults, but still, I, there's something there that seemed noteworthy. Yeah, I, I mean, I'd love to speak to it. So I think, it's, I mean, there's two sides, right? A lot of people are consuming news on Facebook. Uh, I think it's important to note that we don't write news, right? We're a platform and we connect people with sources of news that they find interesting. I think that by and large, it's a good thing because I think that we've helped a lot of people discover a lot of content uh, that they might not have discovered otherwise. We're not the only reason this happens. I think the internet has done that more broadly in a much bigger way and I think that's good. You can, I read, the publications I read are not from uh, San Francisco, right? In the middle of the 20th century, you basically could only read one of, you know, one, two or three papers if you lived in most cities in the country. I think so, that, I think oh, by and large it's a good thing. And I think skepticism is a good thing. Uh, and so, you know, is it, I don't really think trust is binary. I think that you know you, there's a certain amount of skepticism, and you, a lot of skepticism, or a little skepticism. And I think that if people, I don't want Facebook to be a place where people don't trust <coughs> anything. So that means that we've got work to do. But I also think the fact that we have a skeptical set of people who use our platform is is good to your points about yeah. information literacy. Yeah, I think that's actually terrific news to the extent that it was a good survey and uh, was measuring what it says it's measuring. Uh, that that a large fraction of our population hears more of their news stories from Facebook than anything else is hardly surprising because that's where they're spending their time reading. So that they see more news there than elsewhere, completely unsurprising. That they actually recognize that it's not a platform that is a editorial platform, that they aren't selecting the news, they aren't verifying it, that the reliability of it is lower, and that you should be more skeptical about it, that's also great news. Uh, I wish I believed it more, but, uh, but I think it's great news uh, that people recognize that there are different qualities of information and that they should pay attention to the source and they should recognize that if they see it on Facebook, they should, just like we tell our students, if you read it in Wikipedia, it may be right, but don't assume that it is. Go and check a little further if you're going to actually rely on it to make a decision or make a judgment. Jeremy. Yeah, uh, this is for Adam. Um, since so many people get so much of their news through the thoroughbred of Facebook, and I think a large contingent of the population, that's all they receive. And while most people here might visit news websites or watch television news and get kind of a package and a nice diverse mix of stories that are oppositional to maybe what they feel and some stories that are feel good and some things that are upsetting, Facebook's algorithm seems to be designed for pleasurable experiences. You're seeing things that reaffirm your beliefs and um, and because content is just so atomized based on just sharing stories, and if I, if, if I go on Facebook and all I see are things that I agree with, it seems that's what's incentivizing this, this, this fake news and the economic model of fake news. How does, how does someone like Facebook, um, how do you cr present content to people that's maybe upsetting or oppositional to maybe their beliefs? I mean, I, I, I agree, like I wouldn't even want to see things that I disagree with on Facebook, but I have to admit there might be a certain value to that. Sure. So I think a couple of things. One is our, our mission on Newsfeed is to connect people with stories they find meaningful, not stories they find pleasurable, right? And a lot of, the, but we can't really know for every individual what they find meaningful. And some of the things that we look at, which are essentially proxies, like did you like it, are going to correlate with you agreed with it. Uh, but some of them aren't. Uh, and we're moving um, more and more towards so longer signals, I'd call them. Things like did you spend a lot of time reading the article? Did you have a conversation about the article? By the way, people on the internet have long conversations about things that they disagree with like all the time. Uh, we find it's actually, it's, very, like, it's one or the other. Um, you know, for videos, did you full screen it? How much of the video did you watch, et cetera? And more and more, we're moving to those um, longer signals. That said, there are multiple forces at play here. One is that people do self-select into the friends that they have on the platform and the publishers that they follow. And they're gonna self-select into somewhat like-minded friends and publishers, which the same way they do offline. Um, the, and that is a force towards less diversity by overall. Not always, but overall. There's also a force from the other direction, which is people tend to be friends and with a lot of people, hundreds of people is the average, and they tend to follow lots of publications. So for instance, in Europe, the average person has over 50 friends from outside of their country. And it's hard to find 400 friends and 50 of them who live in another country that are all like-minded. 
And so that pushes for diversity. And we find, by and large, these forces roughly net out to, as far as best we can tell, and we continue to look into this, because this is important. It's a really important question. That people are exposed to about, uh, about as much content that they disagree with on Facebook as they do off Facebook. And that's important, and we want to make sure that that um, stays that way. We have about five minutes left, so we'll try to get a couple more. Uh, She's we're really been waiting in the back there. Yes. And she yes. might she might hurt the guy next to her if she yeah. doesn't get to her. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I guess I think fake news is a really important topic and I'm glad we're talking about it. But it also seems kind of premature to me to talk about fake news when millions of people in America don't have any trust in the media establishment at all. And so I guess my question is is our concentration on this a little bit misguided? Should we be focusing on fake news? Or instead, should we be focusing on building up trust in America in the media in general? It's really <laughs> well, or, or, and let me ask you, do, do you think that fake news is another way of describing this larger sense of mistrust in the media? Is that the reason it's taken on so it's, it's been so widely adopted by people and applied to wrongdoing that has nothing to do with fabrication. Yes. Well, I think, <laughs> I think the issue is that some people might not trust anything any media mainstream establishment has to say. They don't care if Facebook or somebody else flags it as fake. They think, okay, if it's coming from a quote unquote establishment news source, I'm not gonna trust it because I don't trust the you know, establishment. So what I'm wondering is why are we focusing on this kind of small subsect and why aren't we looking at the bigger picture? Um, <laughs> I, I actually, I, I think it's a, a really important question. And I, I think unfortunately, you know, we haven't talked much about just the problem of financing media right now. And that, and you know, there used to be, you know, armies of local news reporters who were within their communities and out there representing their local community, and so you could have a relationship with them. And so we also are at a moment when local newspapers are going under, and I feel like somehow, to address this question, we have to come up with a way to have more local news that's interactive with its community, that has boots on the ground. I mean, I started, the first news I reported was going to local community board meetings, you know, and looking at, you know, issues over like double parking, you know, and, but that, that kind of being there in the community is really important because then people feel like it's their media. I live in the Mission in San Francisco and Mission Local actually has become a source about my community and it has its flaws or whatever, but I kind of trust them because they're right there. And I think that problem right there is huge <coughs> and we need to do something to address it. And you know, it, it's probably bigger and beyond this panel. Well, one more question. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> She's claimed it. Hi. Uh, I wanted to ask about public data and accountability. Uh, so my data analysis actually showed an increase in fake news shares from like hundreds, hundreds of thousands in May to millions in November per day. Um, and that's using what data I was able to find. Um, and I don't know like, if people would trust me or Facebook, right? And on a broader level, Facebook and Google can instantly restructure the entire incentives around the media ecosystem, right? They can decide what news gets attention toward it. And do they have responsibility to provide transparency about how their code impacts that. For example, they could provide aggregate, aggregate data about how much attention is being directed to what content and sites. That would be like one example of this sort of um, accountability in public data. So I, I should probably take this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think we have a lot of responsibility um, to be as transparent as we can. Uh, most importantly, to communicate our values and our standards, which guide all of our decisions. And that's important not only from public accountability, but also from a partnership perspective with publishers so they know what we're doing and what we care about so they can uh, you know, decide to align or not align, et cetera. And for our users, so to your point about literacy, so they can understand how the system works. Um, I think that when it comes to issues like fake news, it gets challenging, and you can do things like aggregate data, but it becomes challenging because of the adversarial relationship. The more specific we are about what we're doing, the less effective it becomes. Uh, and so it's a balance. Uh, and I think that we're getting better. So if, um, on my time at Facebook, over the last three years, we've announced every major ranking change proactively. 
uh, which wasn't the case when I started at Facebook eight or nine years ago. Uh, so we do, we, do, do, we do put a lot out, but I think where we have the most room to improve is to figure out how to more effectively scale that outreach. Uh, because I regularly meet people who don't know, who, th who think things that are, that are um, uh, co um, confidential that are not. And so we have to, more, we have to more figure out how to more effectively scale our outreach, and that's a problem that I'm taking um, pretty seriously. Uh, starting last year, but definitely this year. Um, I'm talking to people who are doing similar work, analyzing uh, networks of fake news, and for that matter, uh, bad actors, harassers, and all that. That stuff's ongoing. What a platform, a, te a tech platform can say about that is sometimes constrained by law or regulation, particularly in Europe. Uh, I'll add, since, again, this is based on talking to people who are doing this, uh, be careful, because if you're doing analytical work which can expose networks and some bad actors, uh, they fight dirty, and so uh, be careful. Well, with that, we've run out of time. I want to <laughs> <laughs> thank our panel from my left, Lord. Laura Seidel, National Public Radio, Adam Masseri, Facebook, Craig Newmark, founder of Craigslist, Internet Pioneer, uh, Catherine Crum, litigator and professor of law at the University of California, Berkeley, uh, Jeffrey Ma Maggie Mason, at, uh, who is economist and professor of information, University of California, Berkeley. I'm Ed Wasserman, dean of the Graduate School of Journalism at UC Berkeley. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much.